Welcome everybody to Ray of God. I am your host, Saima Dyer, and I am delighted to be welcoming you today to a very special Ray Reads session. This is a little bit of a family affair, um, and I'm seeing some lovely family members popping in to the room as well. Today we are going to be discussing the debut picture book from Uzma Taj, You Be Me and I Be You. I'm going to read the blurb for the book and then we're going to discuss a little bit about Uzma. So, Ibrahim wants to fly. That's all he ever dreams about. And one rainy day, Ibrahim is visited by a great horned owl who wants to be human. Join Ibrahim on an adventure of self-discovery and surprising friendships, also featuring the wisdom of crows, many pigeons, and the sacred sound of trees. So this beautiful picture book has been written and illustrated by Uzma Taj. And she may be known to some of you as Only Taj. That was her pseudonym for many years. And that is how I met her um, many, many years ago at university. And some of you may have seen um, the newsletter that I put a little review in. When I met Uzma, she was um, and still is a doodler an illustrator extraordinaire. And I remember, I was, I was reflecting on this book and her journey and my journey with her. I remembered being in university lectures. Uh, we did different courses. Um, so I'd be in my lecture and I'd open my very pristine and carefully, you know, like managed notepad and find a little doodle in the margin or I'd have my stack of post-it notes and I would be going, you know, taking one off and then all of a sudden I'd find a surprising doodle just joyously springing out. And that is Uzma. She is joy and she brings joy wherever she goes through her work and her words. And I'm going to invite her to join us now. Welcome, Uzma. Hello. Mm. It's lovely, lovely to be here. Oh, well, it's lovely to have you. And um, let's, you know, I'm going to start off with one question and then I'm going to share a little video. But you say in your in your in your bio at the back of this that this started when you were 13 years old. And I know where you where you grew up, but do you want to say a little bit about where that is? Um, as proud Northerners that we are, um, and then a little bit about how it started for you when you were 13 years old. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so hello everybody. Um, so I grew up in a town called Burnley, Lancashire, which is a lovely small northern town. And um, what to say, yeah, so I used to, my sister, my older sister is actually on this call, so she'll probably remember, I used to share little stories with children as a child. And so what I would do is on the street that we lived, I would um, get children gathered around the outside and I would then tell them stories. And it's something that I did and a lot of the kids in the neighbourhood knew about. And this particular story I read I remember I did a puppet show with it and I kind of made it up on the spot to one of my nephews. Um, I don't know whether they, I don't think they remember the stories, but um, Umar and Asman, I would do these puppet stories and I would basically create these animals. And that's where this particular story comes from. And it's it's inspired by Burnley, my living on the, the streets, playing in the streets, the birds, the children. Um, particularly the pigeons. I had a real love for pigeons. Um, and that's where it comes from, yes. So imagine you fed the pigeons as well, because my we used to do that. We used to have very fat pigeons around around us because my gran would buy two loaves of bread and feed one to the pigeons and one for home. Yeah. Definitely feeding <laughs> feeding pigeons. Yeah, it's um it's, it's a story that has changed. I think it was a much simpler version when I originally kind of, I remember, 
I remember it did have like a lot of meaning in the sense that if you if you read the story itself, it's about um, a boy who wants to fly. And I think it's probably, well, I know it's related to this idea of not really being grounded and, and not really wanting to be where you are so you imagine another place is better and I think it's inspired by that and the people around me who I felt did feel like they didn't they'd rather be something else and then just realizing that you're in the obviously when you read the book it ends with the child realizing he's perfect where he is so it's, it's a play on that yes trying to keep it as spoiler free as possible um, but uh, <laughs> So as I was thinking about questions that I could ask you, um, something arrived and um, it was the perfect starting point. So I would like to, before I have questions, and I'd also like to invite all the friends that are here with you, thank you for joining, and please do pop your questions into chat. But I would like to start with, um, with a book review that arrived just earlier today. So let me share this and let me know if the sound doesn't come through. But here we go. So this is um, our reviewer from the South, Iman. Hi, my name is Iman and I'm doing a book review about You Be Me, I Be You. The first one is brilliant drawings. The second one is that it looks great. The third one is that it has lots of animals in. Number four is that there's a little poem at the start. Number five is Ibrahim wants to be an owl. Then he decides he doesn't want to be one anymore. Number six, I really like the detail of the book. And number seven, my favourite page is... 
spread it around. Yeah, it, it was really, I really enjoyed drawing all the little birds. So if you look closer at the bottom, I've also drawn a badger. I think there's a badger there. And I did a mole. Um, that's a hoopy. I know they don't belong in forests, but I thought it'd be really interesting to draw one. And that's an owl. And I think this this book really, uh, you know, I encourage people to um, draw birds. It's such a lovely thing to do is to find a bird and draw it. You learn so much, and I I, I learned so much about birds just because of this. And I wanted I wanted to have birds in the UK, so I tried not to go elsewhere. But obviously, the the hoopy isn't from the UK. Um, yeah, it was just such a lovely experience learning about all these birds in the UK. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. And so that's kind of connecting to the nature that you're exploring, right? So you you, you also say um, in different parts that you've been inspired by the nature that you've you've grown around. That's not just from Burnley. That's your travels in different places around the UK and where you're where you're living now. So can you speak a little bit about that journey, your journey with nature and how that came through in the book? Yes, oh, God. I should have prepared for the questions. Right, um, okay, so for the book itself, I, I suppose the journey from of me in this book is is the relationship with nature in the sense of. So I I come from a um, my tradition is Islam, and then I, it weaved into even Suf, um, the branch of Islam which we call Sufism. And I have a um, my teacher in this group is called is a, a lovely man called Kabir Heminski and his wife Camille Hem Heminski, and he said something um, during my learning period about nature, and it was we were sat in like a big hall, and he basically told us all to go outside and wander around the forest and behave as if we are being seen by the trees rather than we are looking at the trees. And I think this prob probably is the thread within this book. This, Because I think this, is, this idea that we look at a mountain or we walk around and we see the bird, uh, uh, me, myself, anyway, I forget that the the same thing is happening as I'm watching these birds, they're also watching me. And I think the more I've done that, the more that I've realized that there are incidences that I can, that I know now that I have experienced a bird looking at me. And, and I think I would have missed that had I not gone into this into kind of interplay of a journey of knowing that I've been seen and being in that world of being seen. And I think, so that's the, the thread of the story. And then also this idea that when you are curious, um, it's almost like the, the universe is also joins you in that curiosity. So I really wanted to, I felt like that was a big part of me changing this story from its original simple story about a boy who wants to be a boy, um, um, uh, bird to a story where he meets other animals who are part of his journey because, and they're aware of him and this awareness that you're not alone and no matter what journey you're on you're being met whether it's by a tree whether it's by a butterfly but you're always being invited to be curious something like that. Oh, it's beautiful. And <laughs> you, you know, you say the, the journey that you had, right, with, with the birds. So I remember um, probably, what was it, 11 or 12 years ago in Huddersfield, when you were really working on, on the drawings. And back then it was primarily, it was primarily the boy, Ibrahim. And I just want to share one of your early drawings that I absolutely loved. Um, oh God, you still got those. Well, you might have adapted them, but it's like the probably the, the, the first sketch that you've done that I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. And it was Ibrahim in the rain. And I just uh -huh. absolutely loved it. And there was one that you'd done where he was kind of going out and the rain is falling and he's got, and you did a few colored versions that, you know, maybe one day they may be available out there in his yellow raincoat. 
how did your 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 so let's talk more about the art style that you've done so you have you have all these birds i know what you did spending time looking at different but you know pictures but how did your art style develop and how was that for you yeah so it, it's amazing like i i wish i could show you the the original drawings i should have found them but i didn't i didn't find them because i i really like I think if I ever have a class, do something like this in a classroom, which I would love to do with kids, is that is just this, um, how rubbish I was that drawing when I initially started, and and I just, think, uh, I'd just like to jump in there for everyone listening. She was not rubbish. Nobody is rubbish. Oh. All drawings are oh. beautiful, and it is our journey with them. So that we, that is true. We'll have a look it, at those it, one day. That is true. And I think, like, I feel as if my, my style is changing a lot. Even now, I can feel it's, it's totally, it's adapting to a more comfortable style. Like, I think if I had to draw this, um, I'll be good, the mirror. Um, if I had to, um, I probably, if I had to draw this book again, it would look completely different. But I think I really feel the importance of, of practice. And I think that I I think it felt like a miracle because when I started drawing Ibrahim, I, in my head I had this imagination of this really really cute boy, and no matter how many times I drew him, he just didn't look like Ibrahim. And I think I drew him over over a thousand times. I and it was frustrating. It was it was really difficult. But I I do feel like. And that's a really obvious thing to say, but the more you you draw, the better you get. So it's just, and I would say this to all children, is that if you enjoy drawing, you your drawing will will improve. It's and you, it will shock you when you the difference in in that. I know it's a really obvious thing to say, but it's it's such a big it does feel like a little bit of a miracle because I really felt, I think halfway through drawing this book, I would have never imagined that it looks the way it looks now. And even now, for me, it's not perfect, but I'm still amazed by it. Like, I think, wow, I did that. I did that because of hours and hours of work and enjoyable work because I think once you get into a stride and you finally draw the bird that is in your imagination there's an electric feeling and you feel like you can do anything and then you and then your drawings get more and more complex because you you realize you can do this one thing and then you end up it just gets better and better but I, I do think the harder things to do and I still find it really difficult the book that I'm working on now um I think what's e the thing about this book, sorry, I'm talking too much, but the thing about this book is that um, there's not like a lot of action with the boy, like the boy laughing and the you know, there's not emotions. And I think just realizing, I don't know, I've got such an admi admiration for illustrators, how they can illustrate a person going through different emotions. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I'm sorry, did I answer your question? I mean, you, no, you absolutely have. And also, we're here to talk to you. So we, we, we want you to <laughs> share and talk. Um, before we get to Ibrahim, I just want to come back to a point you just made that um, you feel like it's still not perfect. And for the young mm. people that are joining us at the moment, um, I would just like to say to them that that's what, unfortunately, being an artist is, that you're mm. never happy with your work, but at some point you have to, you have to let it go and put it out into the world and then you get the you know you get the feedback and so what would you see say Uzma to aspiring artists and writers who may be listening to us now I think what you said is brilliant I I, I agree I think you have to let it go and I and I think if you think about it I did so many versions of this book and I could have continued for another 10 years easy <laughs> And it would have changed completely. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have been recognizable in ten years' time. But I think, I think something is finished when it is imperfect. And I think that's the thing that I've realized is to to let things go because then you just. 
I don't know, you kind of end up being in this state of incompletion and then you don't do new projects. And I, and I think, I think, yeah, so my, this would be my advice to somebody who wants to be, you know, uh, who wants to start doing the whole writing thing is one is to write. Uh, because I think a lot of people think about writing, but they don't actually write. So I would say to write to just to start. And then I would say, don't think about the end result. For me, I thought about the end result so much that I would get stuck. Uh, I would say, don't think about the end result. And no matter what it is, finish it. So that it has an ending, because I think that is the what's the call what's the word that's the kind of it's kind of being respectful as well to your creation it's kind of like you know edward scissorhand in the movie like the guy never gave him hands like he, i know he died but let's say he didn't die i always found that really sad because he never finished and i think i really feel that that's the biggest thing we can do justice to ourselves no matter what we do finish it that would be my thing. That would be my advice to children. <laughs> Finish what you started. Then and when it and it doesn't have to be perfect, but just finish what you started. I think that's great advice for everyone, really. You know, <laughs> yeah. no matter what age we are, young yeah. children, old children, developing children. Um, absolutely. Finish. And because also if it ends up being something shorter than you thought it was going to be, once you've finished it. It can always grant, you know, give you the seed of a new idea. And you said that, you know, you've got more things that are coming. Um, before we get into those, I just want to go back to Ibrahim. So you said that he doesn't emote so much, but the, the when you do see the way you've drawn him, I can see all the family members. Yeah. All <laughs> your family members are in his facial expressions. Yeah, exactly. Can you say a little bit more about where Ibrahim came from? So Ibrahim came from me finding every picture that I had of my nephew Umar, every picture that I had of my nephew Usman. I had a table, yeah, it had all these pictures in, and then I would use that these two particular faces to constantly draw this little boy. And so it obviously doesn't, it's not an exact copy of these two boys, but it was their kind of, the, the, my two nephews were the cutest nephews ever, I think. Uh, well, I'm sure there's loads of cutest nephews ever. Um, but that's what I did. And I, I just kept drawing, kept drawing, kept drawing. And I think it's, it's, I think that would be a lovely, that's what I'd love to do. I love to gather the original version and you can see the development of how how he turned into Ibrahim. And now the Ibrahim that I that I have drawn, I absolutely love. I love everything about the this little boy's face. Very cute. I think um, you know, that could be an art exhibition one day. The many, <laughs> many faces of Ibrahim um, yeah. or the many art choices of Uzmataj. Yeah. I think it's really helpful as well because I think I, I, I've discovered that with other artists because I think you 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 give up because you just can't get the eyes to look right or the nose is weird or you just can't get the face to look like a human being and I think when you look at other other artists as well and a lot of artists do that and you look at their original idea and then the just the development of it it's it's an amazing thing because it shows you how it doesn't look the way you want it to look for a long time, but it comes together with you just sitting with it. It will come. Well, we have a question that was um, sent to us earlier. So we have a, another video that I would like to share with friends. Oh. And uh, yeah. It's in two parts and I've put them together. So you'll uh, you'll see what the extra part was. So here we go. Um, this is Rumi Kareem from London. Oh, sorry. Hi, Auntie Isma. Thank you for making this amazing book and I really enjoyed reading it. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't be at your um, event about this book. And 
uh, I'm just going to tell you a couple of my favourite parts. So my first favourite part is right at the beginning when we first hear about Mary. So I'll just read it. Running outside, he wondered why he disliked having a bath, even though the rain was a, fav was a favourite thing. He thought it must be normal as his best friend. Mary disliked having a bath too, and she wanted to be a fish. I find that quite funny. And then my next favourite part is the last line, which I'm not going to read because it will spoil it for people who haven't read this book, but I find it really funny. And also, I really like how there are loads of birds and animals and they all talk um, to each other and they all have the same language and they give Abraham advice. I just think it's really nice. Can't wait to see you. Bye. Hi, sorry, I just forgot that I had a question. And that is, um, when you were um, seven years old, what animal would you want to be? Bye. Oh. <laughs> you have your question from Rumi. When I was seven years old, probably when I was seven, I probably wanted to be a type of cat. But I, I probably wanted to be like a wild one, so a little bit tough. So not like a normal cat, probably like a lion or a tiger or a leopard, I think. But then I guess, how would the lion arrive and ask me to swap? I guess I'd have to go to the zoo, but then I'm not sure whether an, a cat in the zoo would be very happy. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to speak the cat. A normal cat, maybe. Maybe a house cat. It could be any cat, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, I I remember also really loving cats and then finding out about big cats and then thinking, oh, how amazing it would be to be these big cats in the jungle, you know, the Sahara, and then you kind of grow older and you just kind of come back to just being, oh, just a, a normal domestic <laughs> yeah. cat. So yeah. the journeys we have with our own imagination. <laughs> exactly. I don't know how we'd survive. But it'd be an interesting story, actually, about maybe, maybe, maybe Rumi could write it. So, where a child goes to the zoo, meets a cat, and then they swap, and then the cat, who's now the boy, helps the big cat escape and get to the jungle. I don't know. <laughs> That's the top of my head. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Rumi, you've got your homework there from uh, <laughs> from the author. <laughs> So coming back to Rumi's other observation about how he really loved how all the animals talk together, it's this kind of universal language, right, that you just, without going into too many details, the animals communicate with Ibrahim, and there is this undercurrent of there almost being one voice, you know, you, you talk about there's the wisdom of crows and many pigeons, but also the sacred sound of trees. And I wonder if you could say something about the spiritual element of this and how you chose to weave meditation into the story as well. Yeah, um, I guess it, it is inspired by this idea that we are not separate to the universe and that we, I guess, are part of the universe or are the universe. So in a sense, we do speak this one language. And it, it's, and I feel as if that it, it, the reason why the med where, where the crow comes in and it, and it does feel like a little bit of a meditation when he asks Ibrahim to close his eyes, I feel like that aspect is about um, the way to communicate to trees and to mushrooms or whatever it is you wanna have a conversation with you do it within that silence and the idea that if you're empty you can hear and i think that's where that comes from um so so for example when ibrahim closes his eyes he's able to hear right and i think it's playing on this idea that we when we're silent that's when we can hear our ancestors voices or our guides or whatever it, our inner desires of what we actually want to do um and then yeah so with the animals all speaking i do feel yeah i do feel like we all do 
because if you think about it, language, I know we've spoken about this before, but this this idea that the moment you introduce language, you change the meaning of the thing you're trying to say, right? Because language is, it doesn't always fit everything in. So the, the secret being that it's the silent communication which holds the, the real information. And in that sense, we all speak because we are all part of that silence. So we are the same language. I don't know for that. I don't know whether I answer yep. the question. No, that's beautiful. And can you give us an example of how you might, how you've done this when you go into nature? Can you give us an example of being in that silence with the birds in the trees so that other people here might think, oh, I'd like to try and do that? I, I don't really do anything. I think it's just, um, you know, th the thing that I did realize recently, and, it's, and again, it's a really obvious thing, is when you, so not when you're, when you close your eyes, but when you observe and really be present in your body. Because I remember we went for a, um, a, a car ride recently, and I, recently, I remember sitting at the back of the car and looking at the trees as the car was moving. And then what I did is I made myself really land in my body. So I landed in my body and then I really, and I kind of felt my observation increase just in that, my presence in the, in the trees. And then I watched how the twigs were and I really kind of made myself look at it. And I can't think of a nicer way to say it. And then what I do remember is when I got home that evening is when I closed my eyes, how much of that car ride had imprinted itself inside me. And I think that when we do that, we don't realize how how much of the the tree that we're looking at or the animal etches itself inside your conscious mind. And I think if when we do that with presence, there's just the power of that merging of the I don't know. Let's say you're merging you're merging into the mountain. It it, it does it almost feels like it appears inside of you rather than what you're looking at and I think that does happen and I can imagine that probably happens to painters when they're painting they're almost painting not by looking they're actually painting from the inside but the, the mountain is their scenery or whatever it is they're painting is coming from here something like that. and when so, you yeah. say you land you land in your body is that through breath and silence yeah, so I always, I think the way I begin is I always start with my feet. I always imagine wherever my feet are, let's say they're on grass, um, I will really, really focus my attention on the feet. And it's a big anchor for me. And then the breath. But I always do the feet, no matter where I am, whether I'm in the living room, whether I'm walking on rocks, I really, really feel all of myself into the, to the soles of my feet. And I remember reading about this idea that we breathe through our feet rather than we. Th so even though the air is coming through our throat and our lungs are moving, the actual um, what's actually happening is the is there's a connection with the feet, the feet and the ground. Anyway, so yes. So to answer your question, I focus oh. on my and my breath. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So almost like so even the air on our skin. Our skin is is absorbing, right? It's like the largest organ, and it's it's permeable. It's you know we're taking it in. I love that. Um, I want to continue this this thread and just read the opening again. Rumi really liked the the poem at the start, and I was wanting to read it and ask you to maybe share about why you chose this and how it's been with you for the journey of the book. So this is a poem from Rumi, and it's translated by Halminski. This is love, to fly toward a secret sky, to cause a hundred veils to fall each moment. First, to let go of life. In the end, to take a step without feet. To regard this world as invisible and to disregard what appears to the self. Mm. 
Yeah, I love that poem. I remember reading it years ago. Um, I love it because I think it, to me, it speaks about being fearless. And I think, uh, I think that there's, there's a real fearlessness in Ibrahim in the sense that he, he just goes with it. And I think you can get that if you combine curiosity with your, your love, so your desire, which I think is also your love for something. And it eliminates the fear. And I think with Ibrahim, you can feel his sense of absolute joy. He doesn't worry about anything else. He doesn't think about all the consequences of this big decision of changing into a bird. And I think if we do that, just the power of that, because I, I, I do feel like um, it is taking a step with our feet, right? Because we are so reserved and we're so careful and we're so planning. And I just, just imagine that life that's lived without those things that you just, you know, with care and consideration for the people, obviously, so not just willy dallying but with that care and consideration and then just following that desire without the control just yeah and I, I and i and i really feel like that's that's the character of the brain taking a step with our feet <laughs> inshallah <laughs> well ibrahim is supported by um his parents in this and i love the fact that you kind of very gently have them in the background being very supportive but what really came through really strongly for me is and this may not be the case for the generation that is you know growing up today but when we were little we would just disappear you know like from the morning until the evening we would be out there we would be um with you know with the fields and just being in nature and probably doing naughty things with worms that you know like oh some people would some little kids would chop them in half and you know it's like but you learn it's like learning from nature even the even the horrible bits um it's part of the growing process and then you realize well maybe i shouldn't do that and i should let the worms be happy and then you see them eaten by the birds and you think oh okay well i created two meals there because just cut the worm <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but so was that intentional were you drawing upon you know how you were when you were young and do you reflect upon how perhaps you know we need that reconnection back into nature um, and the ways that we can do this. So, so the so having the parents was so important to me, but it was also because I, I'm an adult now, and I and I feel like the way the the just this idea that the the child who is curious and takes a step without feet takes that courage from the adults around him and the way and and i think to be to let a child take a step without feet is in its sense a really big thing for a parent to do because i think it's scary right you want to you want to protect that child and so it for me it takes an element of not just the parents but it's just a collectiveness of the holding of the trees, the holding of the parents, the holding of the animals, all for this one little child who's curious. And I think I was trying to get this idea that that curiosity is protected because everybody's around this child wanting him to experience this amazing experience and he's being held and it was it was about that the holding and the responsibility of that because i think to hold that for someone is a big thing and i think obviously parents do it amazingly and i it was it was a yeah it's about that i love that protection that's beautiful so friends, we're coming towards the end of our time. So if you have anything you'd like to share in chat or ask a question, please do let me know. Um, Usma, I was wanting to ask, you said a little bit about you doing some work going forward. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna invite Rahima to join us. Rahima, please do go ahead. Yes. 
Hello. <laughs> um, one question I sort of think I know the answer, but one of the other, he asked one of the other birds to switch places with them and it just flies away. And then the owl shows up and I'm just wondering if there was, you know, what was um, involved with that, with that. And then the other thing, um, and then I'll mute myself again. When I read this, I kept visualizing the movement and wondered and, and thought this would be a beautiful book to create a um, animated short. <laughs> I, of course, I have no idea what's involved in that, but um, I, for some reason, it just seemed like the, the drawings cried out to with some movement. So anyway, my thoughts. Thanks. I would love that. I would love to 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 um, have it animated. I think it would be beautiful. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. It does have a lot of movement, and I think it's it's um, it's on purpose. And I I think it, it it's about the flow of life that um, even at the end it continues to move where it's it has some own lots of threads that you could go with, whether you want to be the fish or, or the boy, or you want to stay with Ibrahim. Um, and then, um, yeah, so the crow, where he waves at the crow and the crow flies away. It, I think it's, it's also about, um, it, it's a play on this idea that we ask the universe, we're always just that, that asking, that constant asking. And when we don't ask, we don't get, because I think a lot of the times, there's a lot of wishes that we we're too shame, ashamed to ask for, and I, and it's a play on this idea that you we should be asking, because then how does the universe know what you want? So this crow that he is 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 about his conversation, and perhaps that crow then spreads the conversation. There's a boy who constantly is asking, and then another bird, and out there there's this conversation happening with all these birds, and then through all these birds an owl who's also querying about being human finds out <laughs> that's the other story Raheem out there somewhere <laughs> thank you Raheem what a great question um we've got one in chat as well so the question is Osma did you write the story first and then the art or did some artwork arrive and feed into the story as well and um, the story I did I didn't I was never intending to have any artwork um, and so the story came, and then when I wrote the story, it, it didn't look, it looked really boring on the piece of paper. <laughs> so then I just stuck the birds in, and then from there it became this. So yeah, so the story came. And, uh, we have Daniel as well. Go ahead, Daniel. I have two questions. Um, the first one being, I mean, the great horned owl is, is a great choice for the bird does it have any special significance for you what why that bird and secondly the book's black and white and it works so well for this book and was that intentional was it by accident and what do you what, what does it bring to the book for you because it really works for me yeah. so the, the the great horned owl um it's um, based on my dad. My dad loved owls and he would constantly joke about the fact that the owl's head goes round and round and the fact that the owl never sleeps. And I think as a child, I, I always felt um, this kind of magicalness about owls because of those two things. Um, the, and the great horned owl is is because I, to be honest, I did a re, I looked at all the owls, and as soon as I saw the great horned owls, I fell in love because I, I think it's so beautiful. Um, and then the black and white element, yeah, it's a real love affair for me of the pencil. I really think one of the best things on this planet is the invention of the pencil. There is something so, um, I don't know what the word is, but there's something so meditative about the noise of the shade 
of the pencil that sound I think is just beautiful and I um I, I do love color so it's not you know I, I think it's I think if I could color if I had the ability to paint I can't paint to save my life but I think if I could paint maybe it would have been painted um so it was a, it was an accidental choice based on the talents that I have but I, I do I do love pencils <laughs> I love that. So I think then this is naturally leading into you delivering a workshop for children of all ages to come and experience the sound of the pencil <laughs> as they are shading. I think that will be a great workshop. So folks, keep an eye out for that. Um, Uzma's uh, website is uzmataj.com and I'm sure there will be information on there when she is able to um, offer a workshop. So Uzma, I want to thank you so much for, for doing this. And um, final question is, what's next? What are you working on? And um, how can we stay connected? I am working on another book and it is killing me a bit. <laughs> I, I just, I, um, I think I need, um, yeah, so I'm working on another book. It's short stories this time and there's 11 of them. Um, I'm really, really, I'm, I'm, I absolutely love these stories and I have come to a point where I need to, to, oh, bless, sorry, I just read a question. Um, um, so I'm, I'm reading, so I'm finishing a book. Um, I would love to do something with um, children, uh, maybe like a, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I haven't got anything planned, but I will put it onto my website so you can keep in touch by um, just subscribing to usmataraj.com and I will keep you updated. Um, and you're also on Instagram at utaraj, um, but there's a link for that on your website as well. Well, I want to thank you and everybody else who has joined us today. And I also just want to say that um, the January sales for Uzma's book um, are being donated to the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. And you can find the link for that in the emails and the information that you received today from Ray. Um, there's also a link on Uzma's Instagram as well. So that's at you, Taj. Do follow her. And you are doing little animations, aren't you? Little animation reels that you've started um, um, experimenting yeah, with. Yeah, I'm learning to animate, um, but that's more just for, fun really I'm not really thinking too deeply because then I'll, I'll probably end up planning too much and then not do anything but yeah I'm really enjoying doing little things moving like birds so that's been really fun um so I do that also but yeah it's 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 lovely I, I really enjoy just drawing if I could draw every day and only draw every day I think I'd be happy well let's put that into out into the universe um, yes. And the birds, birds may hear us and also amplify it and uh, it may arrive. But I think the key, the key word there is keeping the fun, right? So yeah. you're having fun with the animation. You don't know where it will lead. And I encourage all of us, um, everybody here, no matter our age, um, to keep the fun and um, have a little doodle and feel the texture and the sound of the pencil. Thank you, Sma. Thank you, everybody. Big hugs. <laughs> So friends, we will be back next month. Um, we are going to be discussing um, this short story collection um, by a Palestinian author, Sheikha Halloui, and it's called They Fell Like Stars from the Sky. And we will be putting information up about that um, on our socials and newsletter as usual. But thank you all for joining us today um, and much love for the rest of your day. <laughs>